Welcome to the LIRC members meeting. Thank you to all the LIRC members, ILD members, and guests in attendance. As you can see, we're doing things a little bit differently this year. We're very excited about a variety of speakers today. We have IALD President Douglas Leonard with an update uh, on the IALD. We have moderator John Hazer and keynote speaker, speaker Maria Tor Toro Ortiz with her presentation, Workplace and Lighting in the COVID Era. We are your LIRC Steering Committee co-chairs. I am Alexis Arnoldi from Klein Betrich Bernstein Lighting Design in New York City. And this is Nancy Stasis from Nanometer, also in New York City. Our first speaker today is Douglas Leonard. Douglas is director of Douglas Leonard Lighting Designers in Santiago, Santiago Chile. He is a professional member of the IALD and the current president of the IALD. Please take it away, Douglas. Okay. Well, thanks, Alexis, for the introduction, and thanks to the LRC for inviting me to your member meeting. Uh, Alexis, Nancy, and Kelly asked me to share some thoughts about the ILD's present and future. Uh, first thing I, I, I thought is to acknowledge, on behalf of the ILD membership, the continuous support of the LRC members to the ILD especially in this year that has been so challenging for everyone. Thanks for supporting the ILD events, the enlightening conferences, and all the events that our region and chapters coordinators have produced at their local level. As you may have seen and listened from our ILD update for member webinars and presentations, the ILD as most part of the organization has experienced a huge reduction of its revenue basically explained by the cancellation of all the in-person events, including Lightfer, which represents 75% of the ILD revenue pie. Additionally, as ILD shares the partnership with IES and IMC, the International Markets Center, we had to cover a part of the partnership uh, losses of the losses and, and, and the penalties related to this cancellation. While at the same time, through this year, the ILD management leadership has done a great job making all possible revenue expenses reductions, uh, with it, which included suspending all face-to-face -face meetings, we got into virtual work mode, and we even make salary reductions. At the same time, our CEO, Marsha Turner, and her team had to change a lot of almost every process and that included adding new ones to adapt to this new reality and keep delivering the value to our members. Uh, we know that this reality will be around us for a while and we need to change because of that. We will still be serving our mission and our core values, which are community, integrity, collaboration, innovation and leadership, but with less, less resources. We will be doing that from our, an organization that will look different. We are now, during these weeks and months, with the board of directors and the ILD staff, planning for a future that will look different in terms of how we are delivering that value so we can keep the organization relevant, but at the same time, we make it financially sustainable. Because this is an ongoing work, we don't know yet what part of our portfolio of programs or activities will be paused or canceled, but we can anticipate that without a vaccine in place and limitation for traveling, we will keep most part of our international activities at a virtual mode. And then we will see a growth in the number of and the frequency of local activities. Our regions and chapters network will be very important in the months and years to come. And your support to the regions and chapters coordinators in their effort to serve the membership at that local level is crucial. As our past president, Victor Palacio, used to say, the ILD is like a big butterfly garden. And instead of trying to catch the butterflies one by one, we have grown a beautiful garden so the butterflies come and join. 
And as our treasurer, Brent Kurtz, said uh, a week ago, the garden is not limited to butterflies. All species are welcome. The LD has a room for everyone, associates, clients, people interested in lighting. So I think that this pandemic has other crises also bring opportunities with them. And one of those opportunities is to get our membership more involved than ever. This garden now needs more gardeners than ever. Uh, without the resources we used to have, we will need to come all along and support. And we can't with the, our LRC members for that effort. We have our conferences. We just had a very successful conference last week with the Lighting Americas. We had more than 600 attendees. And we will have our Lighting Europe conference next 18 and 19 of November. So we expect to see you there helping us to reach a similar number of members and other groups of interest. Other way of supporting is being part of Lightfair. And instead of talking about this, let's watch a video that will give you a better idea of what is coming. So Joe, you can go with that video. Hello. I'm Leah Trinakis, Executive Director of Customer Relations. I'd like to introduce you to The Collective, an exclusive members only show floor experience at Light Fair 2021. Imagine a show floor where your brand truly stands out, where your booth is one of the select few in an exclusive space reserved for architectural lighting. With only 24 vetted exhibitors, it's reserved for IALD, LIRC, and IES sustaining members only. It's a brand new section at Light Fair starting in 2021 and located next to the Design Pavilion. In addition, you will receive marketing support from Light Fair, IALD, and IES, including daily curated tours. Space is limited. Don't delay your support of the IALD and IES by securing your exclusive exhibit space at lightfair.com. We can't wait to see you at Lightfair 2021 in New York City. Thank you, Douglas. Oh, this is, this is part of, just let me say that this is only part of what, <laughs> of, of what we are doing in Lifer. Lifer is our show and we have worked a lot to improve the show. Reimagining it, the event, to make it more appealing to the lighting design community. So we get more lighting designers there. I'm sure you will get a different experience in the next version. New York City, and I hope to see you there. Um, and, and, and just to close, uh, I, let me share with you that I understand the complexity of the challenges that we are facing. And I'm still confident about our future. And just because all the things we have done this year, and I know that we will do a lot more in the next one. Um, so thanks again for giving me this space to share with you and uh, enjoy your meeting. And now I'll pass it to Nancy. <laughs> Thank you, Douglas. Sorry about that. Um, hello, everyone. I just want to make sure uh, many of us participated in Enlighten Americas and many of us sponsored it. It was definitely a successful conference and we are looking forward to Enlighten Europe and just to remind everyone that sponsorship opportunities are available for that conference. It is that time of year where our LIRC membership dues renewal invoices have gone out. If you have not received them, please be on the lookout. They also can be renewed online at the IELD website. So please be sure to renew your membership before the end of the year. Thanks. This is the snapshot of the current LIRC steering committee. It is made up 
equally of the ILD community and the LIRC membership. The LIRC membership is nominated and voted in by the LIRC members. So it's really a testament um, of your relationship and standing within the industry to be nominated by a group of your peers and of course be elected to serve. You are certainly not limited whatsoever in your volunteer and the capacity by which you can support the ILD or the LIRC by serving on this particular committee. There are many others that are not elected but it is that time of year where some of us roll off and that we open the nominations. All membership should have received a call for nominations of the open positions on the LARC side of the steering committee. If you know someone, um, which is probably almost everyone on this call that would really be able to contribute, please feel free to nominate them. And by all means, do not hesitate to nominate yourself. So I wanna extend a heartfelt thank you to both Nancy and Tom. Uh, both of their terms are expiring at the end of this year, while Nancy is running for re-election for another two-year term as co-chair of the steering committee. However, Tom is rolling off. And Tom, we are so glad that you intend to stay engaged with the LIRC. We really enjoy your insight, your candid discussion, and your dry sense of humor. And while we are accepting new membership throughout the year, this is really a perfect time to join us. There's lots of folks on this call that are invited guests from manufacturers. And we hope that by the time we finish up today, you will feel compelled to become a member because we would love to have you. And please mark your calendars. On November 12th, we have a LIRC virtual event it is a lighting business discussion focused on the Nordic region in Europe. Uh, Johan Rocklander will be moderating a panel discussion with three lighting designers and a developer on the state of lighting and construction industry and where they see it headed in the future. So it's a free event, so please join us. Uh, the event, if the event is successful, we may roll it out to other regions around the world. And our next speaker is our, sorry, today's moderator, I should say, is John Hazer. John has been at AKLD for over 20 years, where he is the Director of Administration and Marketing. John is an affiliate member of the IALD. John, the floor is yours. Uh, hold on a second. Okay, I think that you can hear me. I'm not sure, I'm just checking. Hold on a second. We can hear you, John. All right, I am looking for my notes, which have disappeared be behind my screen. Hold on a second. I am all set up. So this is the fun part of uh, of doing things virtually. Sometimes things go smoothly, sometimes they don't. No, I don't want to leave the meeting. I just want. Joe, have we lost John? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, John, we can hear you. We thought we lost you for a second. I, I think we did. But you're back. Right. I am sorry about that. I apologize for the delay. Uh, thank you, Douglas, Alexis, and Nancy. Uh, you know, unlike many other industries, the LIRC presents a wonderful opportunity for people in the lighting community, both designers and manufacturers, to come together uh, and get to know each other, to talk about design, to talk about technology, 
to talk about innovations, inventions, and all centered around light. For designers, uh, we need the innovative technology and the manufacturers, we need designers to tell us kind of what direction we should come up with those innovations in. So it's really the sharing of ideas. That being said, uh, we have a wonderful speaker today. Her name is Maria del Pilar or Toro Ortiz. She is a professional member of the ILD and also a certified lighting designer. She was formally trained as an architect and has over 15 years in the lighting design uh, field. She is a graduate with a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Catholic University of America and attended uh, the Masters of Fine Arts at Parsons School of Design, specializing in lighting. Uh, Maria was born in Puerto Rico. Uh, she lived in the United States for 10 years, working in the lighting uh, design field with firms such as HLB Lighting Design and Branson Partnership. She moved to Mexico in 2010 and has worked with local design firms like uh, let's see, Avant-Garde, Lighting Design, Art Tech 3, and Ideas in Loose. Maria is enthusiastic and a natural born leader. She has always been actively involved in the lighting community and has served with the ILD Mexico Regional Coordinator for three years. And she was also part of the Enlightened America's Content Advisory Committee. She has worked on a range of a project from high-end residential and hospitality to corporate interiors. For the last two and a half years, she has served as the regional lighting manager for WeWork, where she designed and oversaw over 2 million square feet of office space. That's 178 projects within two years. That's a lot of projects. And this took place in Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Mexico. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Maria, who will be talking to you about many things, and we will be having a question and answer at the end of her discussion. Thank you. Thank you, John, for this. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes? All right. I also want to thank the LRIC for inviting me and uh, for uh, sharing my opinions and my passion for light. Uh, I wanna thank the IALD for always being an advocate for lighting designers such as myself and for light in general. And um, I, the, the presentation that we put together here is a little bit of, of opinions and experiences that I've lived. So, and this is my first online presentation, so please bear with me. And uh, thank you for giving me the time. So I wanna start with this uh, slide. Uh, a few years ago, um, I was at Enlightened Baltimore, Enlightened Americas in Baltimore, and I just walked out of the keynote speaker event, and it was my first Enlightened. And I remember distinctly that I was so inspired by, by Moment Factory, who was talking about these incredible projects in light and these alternative uses that you don't necessarily think about. And then I walk out and I see this banner and it says light is a catalyst. And I just, I read through it and I was so taken with whomever wrote this because I do think it's right. I do think it's correct. I'm an independent lighting designer and I do think I am here because I do think light is a catalyst. Light is what moves us. Light is what changes us. And I want to thank you again for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on it. So I wanna discuss a little bit about evolving workplace workspace strategies. And that is something that is happening and that is very current to, to all of us, not necessarily because of COVID, just in general in the design world that we move in. So why do we construct environments that we want to escape? This is interesting because I was having this discussion a few years ago and I still remember when I lived in New York and the first day that it was 70 and sunny and everybody from all the office spaces would just come down and just go to the nearest park or park bench and you know roll up their shirts and just sit there to enjoy the natural light and enjoy the sun and that is something that we are all like drawn to so we have been there has been a transformation of these workspaces that is independent necessarily of covid 
And it has to do also with the, the work, like the type of work that we do. So what is workplace transformation? The kind of work that we do today is very different than the work we did 20 years ago. And corporate office design has had to adapt and change to meet these, these strategies and these diverse changes. And it's something that has happened uh, throughout the years and is independent, like I said, of COVID. So I like to put the slide together because this is sort of like a visual transition of, of, of what I've seen in the workplace. I am not a workplace uh, designer. I'm not a historian. Um, again, these are like my perceptions and, and a little bit of the research that I've done for this presentation. And I think it's wonderful that we've worked, that we've gone through all these transitional spaces. We went from, you know, 1939, 1940s, the Johnson Wax Building, this first incredible open office building. And then we go to a cubicle, which oddly enough was the result of like the solution to that open office because it does has its pros and cons and it has advantages and disadvantages. It also depends on, on who you are and the sort of work that you do. So, and then we have these sort of open offices once again. This is, uh, these are sort of like a little bit shy maybe, but these are these spaces that start to evolve. And all of a sudden, a few years back, we have these incredible different spaces that just house, like in this image, like a climbing wall. You know, I've worked on projects that have a mini golf in, in, in a lounge. So these are all diverse and really different spaces and new spaces and typologies that bring out, they're supposed to bring out creativity and collaboration because most of the work that we do, at least as designers and, and the world that we move is collaborative work. So the workplace transformation, I think it has to do with these four elements. It has to do with the work that we've done. This work is changing, this work is, is evolving, and the flexible workspaces that started to come up support us in both focusing without a distraction and collaborating in these creative teams. Also, this is interesting, the generation of workers are shifting, um, and a lot of these workspaces are appealing to younger generations. I myself worked with a lot of 25 year olds, 24 year olds, and it was incredible and it was interesting to see the way they appropriated the spaces, which was different than myself or my other coworkers. Technology almost like always continues to shift and to shape the way we work. Um, it is inherent to what we do right now. If it weren't for technology, I wouldn't be speaking to you right now. So we've also, all those changes have had an impact on the workspace and global access. I think this is something that is very important. This is critical. Um, geographical boundaries have been erased. Like John mentioned, I was able to work in a whole region of Latin America because those boundaries have been erased think, thanks to technology. So it's been interesting also to, to all of a sudden go from working in your personal space to go out and working in a whole region or different parts of the world. So what is, and I, 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 I wanna talk a little bit about the open office uh, because that is the current uh, spaces that are under transformation. I personally had mixed feelings. You know, there are pros and cons to the open office. I'd never worked in an environment where you had, you know, a sea of 150 desks. So when I arrived at WeWork two and a half years ago, I, I was a little bit, you know, taken aback. You know, sometimes I was even intimidated by the amount of energy and activity. So you could argue that it is, you know, the space gives way for lower productivity, less interpersonal interaction, maybe antisocial behaviors focus and concentration there are some types and some types of people that need some like enclosed space to be able to do focus work but it also does improve cooperation and communication it gives way to spontaneous collaboration you know all of a sudden you're sitting at your desk and you get up and you go for a cup of coffee and you run into someone and you're like i have this idea and i just can't figure it out and you're discussing this so those instances of like spontaneous collaboration are also thanks due in part to this um, workspace uh, layout. So to talk about a little bit about the future of lighting, I think we need to discuss the, not the necessarily the future of the workplace right now, but the present, like where we are right now. Um, it's interesting because when I joined WeWork, one of the founding um, members said that he wanted to bring a little bit of that residential home feel into the office. 
You know, he wanted sort of like that warmth, that, um, that moment when you sit down and you relax and you just throw your feet up on the coffee table and you just, you know, you're working or you're reading or you're having a chat. Uh, but you, these different spaces, but it was a more relaxed environment. It walked away from these rows of, of desks exclusively and it gave way to different typologies and different spaces for all those different types of work and workers to be able to have. So I really love this image because the new, this is, this was HQ, uh, the we were in HQ in, in Chelsea. And it was a huge, like it was really comfortable and a really relaxed residential feel. I worked many times sitting on those blue couches with my feet up, you know, really comfortable with my laptop in, in, on my lap and just had different opportunities and somebody would walk by and somebody would sit next to me. So it has those advantages. And I wanted to showcase a little bit of these diverse spaces um, that gave way to different opportunities for collaboration. You know, they, these were environments for changing work typologies and that also adapted to different types of workers and different types, not only design, um, design work that happens in these spaces, you know, I don't know, the accountants, the, 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 the general office, I, I don't know, any number and any variety of these spaces. And they were colorful and they, well, they are colorful and vibrant and different. And they also have, like I said, these different, very di different typologies that work. But it's interesting because I'm sort of like an extrovert introvert. And like I said, I've never worked in, in a huge office environment before. So to be honest, I was a little intimidated. And it was interesting to see, um, you know, how different personalities started to adapt and started to use these different spaces. So the image in the top right hand corner is the infamous phone booth. And that was my favorite space. You know, I like nooks and I like phone booths. So it was interesting because if people couldn't find me at my desk for whatever reason and I wasn't in a meeting, I was quote unquote hiding, hiding out in a phone booth. And I literally sometimes just wanted to hide. I needed to, to focus and concentrate and the enclosed nature of the space helped me to do that. Um, and sometimes I would take a meeting in a phone booth and then I would meet it with, and, and I would sit there for hours just, you know, organizing or thinking or just alone with my thoughts because it was, like I said, sometimes it was a challenge for the spaces to work. And I love to share this image because every time I went into a space, I would, you know, check out the phone booth. And um, mind you, this company, I think it was eight years before the lighting design team was officially introduced. So there are many spaces that not necessarily, a uh, lighting designer was not necessarily consulted. And I think you can tell from these images, the spaces where a lighting designer was not consulted. So some of these spaces worked better than others. Um, and, you know, it was interesting because even for this presentation, you know, lighting on your face or lighting for video conference is, is sometimes an afterthought, you know, this is uh, really interesting. And, and also the development of the space um, per se. But then COVID happened and we had to reinvent and we had to shift and we had to reimagine new ways of working all over again. So it is a pivotal moment in, in society, in the workplace. It's a historic moment. And like Douglas mentioned, it also brings us challenges, but it brings us opportunities for us to get creative and, and you know, just find new ways of, of ooh, working and getting our stuff done. We are resilient by nature, so we have been able to do this. So in a matter of weeks, we went from like this crowded office space you know, in these diverse uh, uh, space typologies to improvised home offices that brought challenges in and of themselves. Like this is, this is something that, that I think everybody can relate. Well, if, and we may or may not be on the third image because it also depends on where, where in the world you are and the type of work that you do. But this is also very different. And it also has been a transition from these crowded open office beehive type energy spaces to improvised home offices to improvised or revised home layout because there are any number of challenges right now. 
my work did not change. My place of work did change. Like I said, I was, you know, in the habit of, of working and collaborating with many people all across the region of Latin America and in New York and in different parts of the United States. So the type of work that I did and the way that I did that work did not change. I used to joke that I would get to work either walking or by plane um, because the HQ offices are a short 30 minute walk from here. So it was a really nice walk in the morning. And when I wasn't there, I was traveling somewhere to one of the regions and one of the spaces uh, that we had. So I personally went from working on a crowded uh, airport lounge, which I think a lot of you can relate to, um, you know, travel is sometimes part of the job description. And I went to my dining room table. And then I evolved and I sat down after a few months and I said, this is going to take, this is long term. This is going to take a very long time. This is something that's going to happen for many, many months. And we really don't know how. So when the pandemic lost its new car smell, as I like to say, you know, it was like, I don't know, June or July-ish, I just said, I'm going to have to adapt my space because something that you didn't see in that image in the conference, like in the dining room table, is that behind that huge monitor, sometimes we, I had two kids, you know, having, taking school behind me. So it was, the challenges were really interesting. You know, all of a sudden, everybody was at home. You know, we always used to complain, you know, we're never home. We're never here. We can't enjoy our home. And all of a sudden, everybody was home all the time. So we had all these new challenges. And it's interesting because in the past, like I said, I would hide out in a phone booth and try to get some focus work done and try to concentrate, or I would just go home. You know, if I had a lot of work to do or I had different types of work that I needed to do, I would do it from home and then go to the office for other types of activities and, and collaborative activities. So where is lighting in all of this? Right now, like I believe, I'm a firm believer that we need the right light for wellness, for all of our activities. And light also brings people together. It sort of supports all of our activities. And the images you see right now are images of my current workspace. So I also had a lot of challenges. And right now, I am, I am lucky and I really appreciate it. And this is a very personal experience that I have. I have full access to a lot of daylight, which is incredible for me. There's not a single light turned on in my house right now. And it works, you know. Maybe my face is a little overshone, but I can't really dim down the sun right now. So it's been interesting. But at night... You know, if during the day the space is wonderful and I can get my work done and I can get my Zoom calls done, at night it starts to become a challenge. Why? Because I am not ready for this. I was not ready for this. I have two task lights on my desk. And to be able to exercise, like to do my work properly at night, I have to turn on the dining room light, uh, the dining room table light, uh, and some, a couple of lights also in the living room. So I have to supplement with that. And I think we've all gone through that. We have all had challenges um, the ones that didn't have like a quote unquote set home office already set. And it was really interesting because I had to put the slide in because <laughs> one of the challenges that we have right now also is, is not even lighting to do your work, but it's also video conference lighting. And as I was doing the research for this presentation, I came across uh, images like this many, many times. And these particular folks were selling and they were advertising this huge ring lights for for video conferencing and in the images you saw before you saw that there's the, there's a window in the in the back so when i set up my desk and this was my practical thinking after you know having experienced and being being on the on the dining room table for for a few months is that i want to be set up in a way that family members can come and go and not necessarily inter like interrupt the uh the Zoom call because I know everybody has had some sort of like cameo and kids just pop up and pets and everything and it makes life interesting but I just wanted to to avoid that so I was sitting the other way like on the other corner of my desk with the window behind me which was not that great for video conferencing because all of a sudden the image would be a little bit um, burned so it was until that I that I was preparing for this presentation that I really thought about how my face would look in this presentation. I was thinking practical in practical terms, like how do I need the space? What does it need to work? Like how do I need it to work? 
And how will it not interfere with uh, the day-to-day -day activities that may or may not happen in the rest of my house? So it was also interesting to go through that process. And right now, I think we've come full circle, if, if you want to say it. If at first we work in other companies sought to change the workspace by bringing the home a little bit, that warmth feel and that sort of coziness, uncomfortable and relaxed environment into the workspace, now the office is your home. So that brings another set of challenges. If you're one of the privileged 40% of workers who can do their job remotely, you spent the last few months working from home and perhaps you're struggling. Um, you know, maybe more important than lighting is broadband access. You know, um, you know, we've all achieved, I believe, like diamond medallion work from home status, which will include interruptions and crying children and power outages and network failures. It's just, it's just part of it. But whether it's going well or whether it's going miserably, we're doing our jobs from where we live mainly. But we're not working from home. We're laboring under confinement and under duress, which is really interesting. I read a lot of studies and a lot of articles on this, and it is true. Everything changed. All of a sudden, everything changed. The spaces, the work that we did, our, our, our emotions were going up and down and we're cycling all the time. This is a huge paradigm shift in anything and everything that we know. So in the beginning, if this was a sense of novelty, you know, propelled by this dose of adrenaline and I just brought my monitor and I put it on my dining room table and I said, you know, let's do this, we can do this. This is gonna be a few months, nothing has happened. Productivity and study show, I've read a few studies on this, productivity shot up. But it's interesting though, it didn't shoot up because we had better spaces or we had better focus areas. It shot up because, you know, we had an inherent, inherent fear for losing our jobs. You know, all of a sudden the economy was on the table, you know, all of a sudden, you know, economic challenges that we did not know before were on the table. And that fear of losing our jobs, that's not sustainable long-term, that's, that's incredible. So what COVID did is create a paradigm shift that realigned every single system in every industry across the globe in an instant. That's incredible. We're also going through this process of fearing and of, of mourning really for the life that we knew, for that, you know, routine get up take a shower grab breakfast go out the house commute go to the office we took those things for granted because that was our day today that was a routine um but everything changed right now even the way we grocery shop changed you know the, the this pandemic is forcing us to redefine what we are like what and who we value and it's forcing us to adapt whether we have the means where we don't have the means it's, it's forcing us to be resilient and to do it in an instant. So I believe, yes, there are a lot of challenges, but there are a lot of opportunities. So is the office as we know it over? I believe yes and no, because everything changed right now. So we can't go back to those working spaces like we were before. We need to think, we were thinking flexible workspaces and flexible lighting solutions to go with those workspaces. We need agile work environments right now. And I think rather than seeing 2020 as a sign that the era of the office is completely over, I think it's an opportunity to, to redefine what the office looks like, to throw out this legacy thinking. We do miss, like in the beginning, I was fine at home. You know, by month three, I was, you know, the new car smell was still there. But we do miss, we're social beings. We do miss connections. We miss collaboration. We miss interactions. We miss hugs. I was talking to somebody the other day that I even miss these weird instances, like in a conference or a meeting, like we would do with the, uh, the, with the ILD, where you, depends on where you are culturally on the other side of the world, it's like this half hug, or maybe it's a hug and a kiss, or maybe it's one kiss, or maybe it's two kisses, or maybe it's a handshake. And those are like weird interactions that we took for granted, but we, we miss that. So 
right now the the situation is inherently different we need to create this complete workplace ecosystems that are flexible that are accessible that are compliant with social distancing rules and that is not easy i do recognize that that is not easy because what i felt or how how fearful i felt about COVID a few months back is not how i feel right now you know i think we've all gone through these process and we've gone full circle and I went to the office a few months back to grab my things because I realized, again, they were just sitting on my desk, gathering dust, and I needed them. So I was really in shock when I got out of the elevator and took this picture because, first of all, the, the stickers on the floor and those cleaning pads, I'm, you know, I'm still not used to that. I don't know if we're ever going to be used to that. But this was um, sort of like an energetic space. You would walk out of the elevator and you could feel the energy people coming and going elevators were packed you know in the in the um, inside the offices people would go in people would go out everybody would be crossing all the time and it was so quiet so it was so interesting so i also started to do a lot of a little bit of research because i think we're also at this point where we don't no, like, would I go back to that same space? No, I, like personally, and this is my personal opinion, no. You know, it, there was, you know, 150 people coming and going at some point. So um, I was reading also this uh, work from home survey, today, Gensler, and I read a few studies from Gensler and HK and McKinsey, and they had these uh, work from home, uh, uh, like uh, studies, and only 12% of US workers want to work from home full time. Most want to return to the workplace, but with critical changes. And I think that's normal and that's like, that's understandable. But 72% of responders prefer a hybrid model work home location. And I include myself in those 72% because I do think I sometimes wanted that freedom and that variety of these different spaces, but coming and going in these hybrid and in-between spaces that also poses new challenges for the workplace design and for lighting that response to that workplace design. So I want to make a parenthesis here and uh, I want to talk about lighting for the quote unquote new workplace. Um, we have, I'm going to take a step back and go back to the pre-COVID world if we can remember it because I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I feel that that was like 20 years ago, two years ago, it's, it's impressive. So lighting always responds to a space, to a task, to the user. We as lighting designers, you know, I, I, I always joke with people, it's like, I, I need to know what's going on in the space. You can't just give me a blank room and, and tell me to light it because I don't know what's going on in the space. I don't know who's going to inhabit that space. I don't know what the space is for. I don't know the, the cycles of time that people are going to spend in that space. And for me, that's critical information. So while the workplace has evolved and this is uh this is something that i'm going to talk specifically also about my experience in latin america i feel that the lighting has not lighting stayed the same ideas about lighting in the workspace and it did not catch up with this initial lighting transformation so i was watching i was hearing a, a, an interview with um with the head of real estate from WeWork. And it was interesting that he talked about, it's not about changing everything in the world, but focusing on changing how people work. So the change is here and the time is right now. Like if giants like WeWork and Gensler and HOK and other spaces devoted to design of the workplace, workplace and workspace, they are taking notice, they're going to make these changes and they're going to redesign and reinvent the workplace. But what they're going to do is they're going to, to make decisions for us because unless we can work in a truly collaborative environment with them, they're going to design these spaces with a general perhaps idea of light and then go come to us and say, we need lighting for this. So how do we respond to that? And I think right now it is really important and really critical that we start to work together to make these changes because Lighting needs to adapt, lighting needs to respond to these spaces, 
and perhaps take center stage because these are working environments. So there are certain tasks and it's very important for us to consider that. And now I'm gonna talk about a little bit of this whole new world because this is an incredible experience uh, for me personally. So I lived in the States for about 10 years and I worked in both coasts, uh, California and New York. And I've been living in Mexico um, for about 10 years, but the last two and a half years, I had the, work, the opportunity to work in Latin America. So I worked in seven countries, 13 cities, around 178 projects and i apologize john that was a mistake it was it wasn't two and a half million square feet it was in general over the coast of, over the course of almost three years seven and a half million square feet which is a lot and one of the things that i encountered and that i found inc increasingly interesting was that the norms the lighting regulation changed in every country as you cross the border it was a whole different new set of rules and a whole different new set of of challenges that i had to understand and like i said this is my experience this is my personal experience in the region so i'm not sure if you know that but these are the seven countries that i worked on and uh these are the seven norms that i had to read and i had to revise and i had to analyze and one thing that is common to all of them, they're focused on quantitative lighting. They're focused on throwing a ton of light, 75 centimeters on the workspace, and that's it. And some of them may have uh, considerations for glare and uniformity, but others just don't. And it was interesting also to learn because in the IES, the IES makes recommendations for workspaces and workplaces, which is great. But in Latin America, and this is something that happens also in, in Mexico, every single norm is tied to the uh, Department of Labor or whatever entity that is responsible for workers' rights and their well-being. It has to do with safety in the workplace in terms of electrical also um, installation, but it also has to do with, with the worker and their, their safety rights. So there, it's a norm like Norma Oficial Mexicana, it's a decree, it's a law, it depends, but they're almost always tied to safety and hygiene in the workplace, which I thought was really interesting. What is also interesting is that all of these norms and regulations have not been updated in many, many, many years. The NOM 025 in Mexico um, is from 2008. And we all know that, you know, many things have evolved in the lighting industry and, and you know, in, a few, in the last few years. And if you count the last few months with COVID. So it's been interesting because there were some requirements that just did not make sense to me. In Mexico, for example, the NOM 025 says that you need 300 lux on a work surface for an office. But if you have a computer room, you need 500 lux. So if you argue, like you can argue right now that every single office is a computer room because you cannot do your work without your computer, does that really mean that we need 500 lux with my computer on the horizontal surface? So why do we have to observe these antiquated standards and without verifying if it's really a good target? Um, these these spaces i really love that image because we have to shift our thinking from thinking about luminance to thinking about illuminance because everything is changing right now well everything changed and this is also the type of work that we did and if you see the second image it's it's a measurement that i took in a space that was adapted before i got to to we work and they were adapted this is in colombia to comply with the local norms and regulations i couldn't really take a full picture of the office because it was a private office um but also you didn't want to be there you had 829 lux which is about 77 foot candles and 6500 k lamps so it was really harsh and really aggressive that space you didn't even want to be there and i'm arguing like it's more representative what we perceive and it's also depending on color because it's like i've always said 5000 watts in a black room is still black 
you can throw light at it. You can throw more light at it. It doesn't mean that it's going to make it better. So I think it's really important that we start to understand uh, these changing natures of the spaces and the changing uh, nature of the work that we're starting to do in these spaces. So we need to recover, I think, contrast strategies in the face of perhaps excessive uniformity. Uh, I understand, uh, you know, the need for, for uniform light environment, but I think we just need to question it. We need to also need to understand the use of the space in this humanized and flexible way. We inhabit those spaces, and this is something that I've always argued. Like, we don't design light for architecture. We design light for architecture that we are going to inhabit. So I think we need to be adaptable and we need to do those changes and understand that also that the use of the space may change. And I think we seriously need to reassess these lighting standards from quantitative measures to qualitative measures. And this is something, like I said, that is happening in Latin America, but I do know that happens in places in, in Europe. So I think it's really interesting phenomenon. And a few years back, you know, when LEED started, it was, I, I sort of summarized it in this way, LEED is for buildings and well is for people, which I think is fantastic because anytime I can argue about qualitative light instead of quantitative light, that's going to be to my advantage. So, and health is now more important than ever because we all know the influence that light can have on our well-being and, 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 our, and on our people. So we need to be conscious of the impacts of what we create. We need to be conscious of how we respond to those spaces and we need to be conscious of the type of lighting and the amount or quantity of lighting that goes into these spaces. Um, I insist we need to shift from a quantitative perspective to a qualitative perspective and the time is now because we are undergoing more changes. I love this image because when I think about quality, I, I think about the sun, you know, I was one of those people who would run out at noon and, you know, throw myself on the ground, on the grass and roll up my pants and just, you know, bask in the sun. And here in, in my new work environment, I, I always just pull open the shades and just want all this daylight for me. But I have this incredible story because, and, and I swear this is true, a few years back I was working in a hotel in uh, Tamarindo, which is the west coast in Mexico City. And they were building a mock-up room for this, for this hotel room, which is great. So all of a sudden, the client calls me and he's like, Maria, I need to know what kind of, I need the spec for the light for the sun. And I was like, wait, what do you mean the spec for the light for the sun? He's like, yeah, so who do I buy it from, GE or Philips or who? I'm like, wait, you want to replicate the sun for the mock-up room? He's like, yeah, so what fixture do I buy or who do I buy it for, buy it from? And I was just, I started laughing unconsciously because you cannot, like, we can aspire to the sun. The sun is our goal, but to replicate the sun in an enclosed environment, it, for me, it was just like, it was just incredible. And to this day, I still laugh about it. And every time I see this image, I appreciate the complexity because the sun is dynamic and the sun changes color and the ch sun changes position. So you wanna replicate that, the sun, but what day, at what time, in what position, you know, in what place of the universe. So this is, this is really interesting and I still laugh about this, this story because yes, I wish I could replicate the sun, but what I do right now is I go outside or I open my blinds. And like I said, I'm privileged in that sense. And this is a space in work in, in Paris in Lafayette, and this was an old bank building. I'd love to show the image of the space because the electric light, to, to be honest, in that space was unnecessary at the moment. You walked in and you felt this incredible dose of light that was just coming in from this beautiful skylight and this incredible building. And it was so nice to be in that space. And like I said, we didn't even need the electric light that was just there. So lighting was the protagonist in that space. That, you know, that, that skylight was a protagonist and it was beautiful and it was amazing. And I think a lot of you can relate to, to, to those spaces that we've walked in and we've said, oh my God, this is incredible. And it's just daylight. But then COVID happened. 
So remember, I made a parenthesis. So I talked about the workspace and then COVID, and now I'm talking about lighting and now COVID. These are changing times. There's this incredible quote from Mario Benedetti, which is an Uruguayan poet and writer. And he says, Cuando teníamos las respuestas, nos cambiaron las preguntas. When we had all the answers, they changed all the questions. And they did change all the questions right now. We are in that moment in time where they have changed all the questions. And also, it's also important to understand that we can pose new questions. We can rethink all of this. We can challenge all of these notions. So this is incredible. This is our chance and our opportunity to define what this change will look like because it's changing inevitably. So we just need to get in with this and figure out what that change looks like and what it will become and how it will benefit us, how it will affect us and benefit us. So these are new ways of working. We're gonna have new in-betweens. We're gonna have new hybrid models. We have new considerations for um, lighting and health. So what does this mean? It was interesting because like I said, we've come sort of full circle and we, you know, we were wanted to bring the, the home into the office and now we brought the office into the home. But what is like lighting, what is, does lighting look like for those spaces or for those in-between spaces? Or how does it work for me to go from one space and transition to another? Like, what does this mean? Like, do we need better home office solutions? Do we need better uh, transitions? You know, I think perhaps the distinction between those spaces, you know, office and home and home office and work office should soften. You know, we, what does lighting look like for that? I think, I think we as an industry, and this is why I stay in, and this is why I stress that this is our moment, we need to come together and we need to think about this. Maybe I don't have a solution for this. I don't have an answer for this, but I do think the question is important. So if architecture is the will of the age conceived in spatial terms, like Ms. Van der Rose said, what is, what is it gonna look like now? Like if the workplace is shifting, how can we as an industry, how can we as lighting designers, the ILD and the LRAC and the IES and everybody who's involved in this make a change and come together to respond to these places and to these spaces? Will we go back to any of these spaces? We don't know. But the important thing is that I think we are in a position right now that we can decide actively and we can have an, like, we can have an input in, in how these spaces in the end will look like. I wanna finish with a fun part of a collaborative experience and I wanna call it the ultimate collaborative experience. And I wanted to stress the meaning of the word because one of the things that we miss the most right now, or I miss the most right now, is that, is collaboration, perhaps spontaneous acts of collaboration that happen in the office, creating with somebody, bringing ideas together. We miss these spaces. We are social beings by nature, so we really miss these spaces. And this is a fantastic example of collaboration that I had in my experience in Latin America. So for those of you, like, why does collaboration matter? And why did it matter to me? I did not know this, and perhaps a lot of, most of you don't know this, but Latin America, even though spaces look really close, it's really, really big. Like to get to where Douglas is, is from Mexico, it's 10 hours. Like the closest country that I could go to was Costa Rica, and that was three hours. So, I could not be at all these places at once. So it was a challenge for me to have come all of these ideas and all of, all of this information that came from HQ and sort of quote unquote tropicalizar or regionalize all these experiences and all these products also to be able to create these experiences. So I had to go to every single country. I researched, I met with, any number of vendors and manufacturers that I did not know. And I established this personal connection. So after I met with them and after I talked to them and after I explained them what we needed, what we wanted, you know, the time, you know, what we expecting from them, there was a bond that was already, that, that was, that was done, that was made, which was fantastic because that enabled me to be able to do my work. And I think this project that I'm going to show you is, is, the, is the precise example of that. 
So this was a marketing installation in Chile. I did not know Chile. I still don't know. I've been there three times, but only to Santiago and, you know, to a really small area. Um, I had no budget. And I'm not saying this in figurative terms like, oh, I have no budget. I have little money. I had zero budget. This was a marketing project and I had zero budget. Um, I'd been in the company for about two weeks or three weeks. I knew nobody in the region. Like I said, I was just there and I was sort of trying to understand and assess uh, what the region looked like and, and like all these spaces. And it was a challenge. So this is a space It's called Casa Foa. It's sort of like a design house and different companies and different uh, types of vendors do um, interventions in these spaces. And this was a concept uh, that the designers came up with. All of a sudden they were like, oh, we have a lighting designer, let's talk to her. So I get on the phone and I start talking with people. And one day, one of these vendors that I've worked with for many, many years in, in Mexico City comes to, comes to the office and we're talking about, um, you know, I, I wanna understand what products they have, you know, for, for, for regionalization of products. And he, he looks at me and he says, you're very stressed. I was like, yeah, I have this issue in Chile and I have no idea. I don't know anybody there. I have no idea how I'm going to solve this. And he said, I have somebody in Chile. I was like, you do? So he picked up the phone and he just called his, his, his contact in Chile. And just like that, we were connected. It turns out that they were willing to loan us the fixtures, even though we had zero budget, because they just wanted to, they, they were going to take the, you know, the chance. They were going to bet on this. They were going to bet on this marketing installation. And they, I think a little bit they were betting on me because of that relationship that we had. So the conversation sort of went like this. It's like, um, when is this project? Oh, it's in three weeks. It's like, oh, nothing will make it here. So what do you have in stock? Oh, I have track heads. Um, they're 26 watts. They're 25, 2700 lumens. I have four blacks and narrow flood, and I have six whites. One is a flood, one is a spot, and one is a, is a 22 degree, I don't know if to call that, a narrow flood. So I was like, whoa, you have four blacks and six whites. So I said, okay, let's put the black track heads on the white track and put the white track heads on the black track, you know, to make it look intentional um, and, you know, figure out how we were going to do this. And Remember this, sp this space, like this dark, incredibly, you know, challenging space, if you want, this was the end result. And I think it was fantastic. And I want to bring it here because the concept and the idea of together in that space, this was a collective swing. So you all had to sit on the swing to be able to move it. So like it, you couldn't move it with one person because it was really heavy. So you had to move it together. So I think this is something that is really relevant to what I'm talking right now with you, uh, with the ILRIC, with the lighting designers, with the industry in general, and with the times. So this was the end result of the space. And I, I did not go to Chile. I did not aim a single one of these lights. I did not take part in absolutely any of that. This was all WhatsApp and phone conversations and emails and, and whatever. But the, the amount, like the, the, the level of collaboration and understanding that we were able to achieve, we were able to, to, to achieve this incredible space. Like I said, I wasn't there. I never saw this in person, which is really a little bit sad. But it turned out incredible. It's, you know, full of contrast. You know, the shadow patterns look incredible. The texture is being highlighted. Everything is aimed where it should be. And I think that was incredible. That's like the best story, the best collaborative story, if you want, that I have. So, again, I want to say this, and I want to leave this here in the back of your heads. If the workplace is shifting, I feel that it is our responsibility as an industry to have a voice in this. How can we come together and start with designing these spaces or having an opinion in these spaces from the beginning? Like how can we as an industry take control and have a voice? And perhaps, I don't know, lobby or, or I don't know how we're gonna do it, you know, raise your hand and say, you know what? 
in Latin America, you don't need 750 luxes on a horizontal surface, you know, in a working office space right now. What do we really need? You know, what is the measure of what we really need? And I think it's really important that we need to challenge this. And I say this specifically in Latin America because I've had to comply with all these rules and regulations and I don't agree with half of them. I understand and I, I am for anything and everything that has to do with, you know, the quality of the light. And there is a somewhat understanding of us underneath those lights when you talk about uniformity and glare, you know, the UGR. But it's just a massive amount of light. And right now is the moment. The workplace is shifting again. And I think we can come together and we can actively influence that change. And I want to close with this slide again, because I do believe that we have an opportunity to change. And I do believe that we have an opportunity to change the world. I don't think that's ambitious at all. And I think we just need to come together as an industry. We need to discuss these things. We need to challenge all the rules and all the norms and all the regulations. And we need to come up with new solutions or revised solutions or alternative solutions or flexible solutions. I don't know. I don't have an answer for this. This is a discussion that I've had. And this is a conversation that I've had with many, many people. So light has an amazing power. It has an amazing power to transform how you feel in a space you know, to highlight the texture, to bring people, to move people through the space. So I do believe firmly that lighting can change the world right now. And like I said, it is not ambitious at all. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions. Well, thank you, Maria. You know, if we were in person right now, there'd be about just under 100 people applauding. <laughs> and I would be picking up a microphone and I'd say, okay, we're going to open this up to the audience and uh, for our question and answer. I'm going to encourage people to write into the Q&A. And uh, if you do have questions, I'll see if I can uh, funnel them and get them out. Uh, so while I'm doing that, I just want to, first of all, thank you. You did an excellent job. I'm speaking on behalf of everyone that was watching. And this is a recorded uh, talk, so uh, you can, those that are watching, feel free to tell your peers about this too. Uh, one of the questions I have is, uh, what, what do you miss about not being in your office? Oh, wow. Um, laughter. <laughs> um, collaboration and laughter do you remember those moments that all of a sudden you were sitting on your desk maybe trying to get some work done and somebody said something on the other corner of the of the office and everybody just burst out laughing and all of a sudden you were just laughing you had no idea why but that break that moment that parentheses of of just joyous laughter sort of recharged you and reset you and then you would go back to doing whatever you want so i do miss that and I miss collaboration. I miss spontaneous collaboration. I miss those moments where you would, you know, get up from your desk and go grab a cup of coffee and bump it to someone in the lounge and go like, oh, give me your opinion. You know, I don't know how to work this out. And I think that's mostly what I miss. I miss people. I think we all miss people, but I miss yeah. laughter and <laughs> collaboration in whatever shape or form it took. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, another question is, is it possible for you to elaborate your thoughts on the hybrid approach to the post-COVID office space? Uh, what do you envision the office to look like? Uh, how, will be, how will the workspace re be reinvented? That's a fantastic question. And I don't think that's a question solely for me. I think that's a question for all of us and for the industry. We need to, like I said, we need to think about this and we need to challenge. One of the things that did happen in my work in the last two and a half years is, and this is a very simple change. We sort of changed from cool lighting to warm lighting for X, Y, or Z reason. So going from warm lighting in the office to going from warm lighting in my home, it was not like that distinction is not, was not that harsh. Um, I do have incandescence in my home, and I will admit to that. I am sorry about energy consumption, but it's the type that of light. Good. <laughs> but it's the type of light that I love, you know, sunlight, incandescent, warmth. Um, 
you know, I'm one of those people who used to go like, you know, Home Depot and just search in the back and the back and the back of the, you know, the last incandescent lights that there were available. But I think that color temperature shift also made the sort of transition a little bit softer. I don't know what these hybrid in between spaces need to look like. Um, I know that we need to figure out what we need and we need to have adequate lighting and right lighting in both environments, you know, whether it's the home, whether it's the office, whether it's the home office or, or whomever. Okay. Uh, another question is, um, let's see, do you feel light, uh, do you feel lighting manufacturers are successfully evolving away from legacy lighting? I think so. I think, um, in the last years, I remember the first light fair that I went to, for example, that it had any and all sorts of different types of lighting, including those, you know, metal halide football giant things. And then all of a sudden, years later, you go into a light fair and everything is LED. And I personally was a little apprehensive because I did not think LEDs were ready for absolutely everything. Like I said, I still have incandescents in my home. Um, but I do think there's been an increasing level of, of technological development and collaboration. I think we're listening to each other much more because either we as lighting designers come up with a weird application for a different product or the manufacturers come up with this weird product or different product or innovative product and want us to use it and we need to figure out how to do that. So I think there's been increasing um, discussion and in increasing collaboration and I think that's going to be the center of it. I think that's going to be what's going to be really important for the development or the furthering of the industry as a whole. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, how do you foresee the, speaking of industry, how do you foresee the industry shifting to support flexible spaces uh, for workspaces that our workspaces are asking for specifically regarding sustainability and energy consumption? How can the lighting design be multi-purpose yet remain layered and ex ex experiential without blowing energy allowances over designing of, and over designing? It's like wow. that's, that's, yeah, I know. I read this like, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, that's a lot to take in. Um, I think a key word in all that was layering. I think that's sort of, of crucial. We always used to talk about, you know, three layers, you know, ambient, accent, and decorative. And I'm always a firm believer that the space needs to work without the decorative light. You know, it just adds to the space, but it must not take away from that space. So I, like I said, I don't have an answer to, to most of these questions that I'm, that I'm saying. Um, I think layering in general is key to lighting design. You know, I think to a successful lighting uh, installation, different layers are, are crucial. In that project in Chile, we had these track heads that are going down and casting these shadows, but there was also a strip light throwing in direct light and lighting all that, you know, age structure. So we did have sort of layers in there, and I think that was successful. As well as energy consumption, LEDs have helped a lot with energy consumption. I know, for example, in California, you have Title 24, which is really stringent, um, and in other parts of the world, you have different, um, different regulations, but Perhaps this is something that we need to address. Perhaps we need to go back and say, you know what, we need to make allowances for this and just, you know, say why, you know, these are arguments and these are reasons, you know, because I think I'm a firm believer right now, like energy can't be on one side and lighting on another and office design and architecture on another. We all need to come together right now and figure this out together. I right. hope that answered your question. That was a really yeah. fun and challenging one. Well, speaking of that and coming together and different areas of the world, you did discuss a little bit about the norms of different countries for lighting. Could you expand on that a little bit as far as, is there any solution to the differences? Uh, you know, it seems like in ways we all have the same sun, we all are using similar technology, uh, but as far as it appears that various countries have different types of standards and norms. Uh, is, is there any uh, thing that you could address with regards to that? Well, I think I've, like from what I read from all of the norms in the region, one thing, like I said, that was interesting was that lighting is 
falls onto the purview of the Department of Hygiene, Sanitation, Labor, whatever you want to call it, um, which gives it another set of connotations. Um, and I didn't mention this before, I'll just mention it now. The worker can sue the employer if they do not have, if they do not comply with the local regulations because they have, they have a right to the right light, the right amount of light, uh, you know, even if we don't agree with what the regulation says. So one thing that I did see, for example, is that in some regulations, they were, they were just calling out quantity of light, you know, 500 lux on a horizontal surface, you know, 75 centimeters AFF. Or if it's an open office, 750 lux, 75 centimeters AFF. Um, but there were some norms that did call for also uniformity and UGR, which I think was important that they were, weren't only necessarily focused on the quantity of light that was going on the surface, but the UGR I thought was really important. And I think that's a beginning. Um, I think we need to emphasize control and optics much, much more because part of the discussion I had in the whole region was like, yeah, you can get this regular polycarbonate lens and it's X amount of dollars, but if you get it with, you know, a UGR, uh, you know, with an optic or with a louver or something, it's like almost twice as that. So how can we make that solution, which is better for us as users, also more accessible, you know? So right. I think that was, that was really interesting because the discussion first was to change the lighting and then the discussion was like, oh, optics, why, is op why are optics important? Because we're sitting under these lights all day. Right. We were. <laughs> all right, well, with that being said, you know, as I know you're a lighting designer, but also those in the manufacturing of lighting, uh, you know, what type of opportunities do you envision that we can work together during this pandemic and, and also beyond? I mean, our, it appears that, you know, our, our whole world is, for lack of better words, kind of up for grabs. Everything that had been normal, it's questionable whether it's going to come back, and if so, how it's going to come back. But it appears that there are going to be opportunities for those of us in the line design, as well as those in lighting manufacturing. Do you have any thoughts about that? Collaboration. Like, we need to challenge all these products and all these solutions and all these, quote-unquote, uses for these fixtures. I guess it's a great moment to sit down and talk and discuss and analyze why we use the products in the way that we use them and how can we change them and how can we improve them. I've seen incredible project like products come out of the collaboration or like the modification between a lighting designer and a manufacturer uh, because of the challenges of the job, be it, I don't know, installation or time or whatever any challenges but i insist we keep, need to keep talking to each other we need to keep asking for each other's opinions we need to keep um discussing and and just questioning like you said everything is up for grabs right now so you know if we have a downlight and we just put it in a ceiling or in like seriously what kind of downlight why like how can we do it you know how can we do it better what are the optics i don't know but i think right now we need to question everything yeah. Another question. How do you think lighting, acoustics, and lighting controls need to work together? Right? Oh, my God. They need to work together. Yes. Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Thank you. This is not like lighting and then controls. It's like one thing that can come together. And acoustics, I, I recently understood or the importance of acoustics because we had a lot of acoustical problems in a lot of places. Um, and these are also critical. Like if you're designing these spaces for collaboration for conferences, they all need to work together and controls can't be an afterthought. Like they cannot be an afterthought. It has to work. It has to be part of the solution from the beginning and from the get go, because there are any number of advantages to that. So I guess together, <laughs> and I don't know, I'm not an expert on acoustics. I've, I've known, I've learned a little bit about reverberation, um, but I want to learn more because if we can figure out a way to make these solutions completely seamless, I think it's better. Like, you know, if, if the lighting that doesn't necessarily need to be the protagonist in a space. It just needs, the space needs to be the protagonist, the functions, the, the colors, the materials. So if we can figure out a way to make that interaction seamless, I think it's going to work better. Gotcha. 
I agree. Uh, I have another question. This is a little bit more on the technical side. Do you plan to incorporate UVC either 254 nanometer or 22 nanometer appro appropriately into the office lighting areas? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I'm not an expert in UVC lighting right now. I haven't. I've, I've done a little bit of research and I've done a little, you know, I've done a little bit of reading. Um, I'm not exactly sure, and this is my personal opinion, that uh, we are ready to put these lights in spaces where people inhabit. Um, we need to be very careful with that. We need to be very careful about the quality of light that goes into spaces that people inhabit. So I am not sure, but perhaps the next time I see you or give this presentation in hopefully a full room with you, um, I can... Um, I'll have a better answer for that, or I'll have studied it a little bit more. So I'll take that as a homework. Okay. All right. Another question. Uh, how will office lighting evolve as workers slowly return after COVID-19? Do you have your crystal ball out? Any, any further thoughts with regards to that? And no, not necessarily a crystal ball, but I think it's, it's part of a result of, of how these spaces are changing. I think flexibility right now is a key word for absolutely everything because where you had a space where you had eight desks for eight people, now you can fit four people. So, and it's the same space. So there are going to be inherent changes in, in the workplace or the workspace when people return. Um, some spaces on um, some places will be easier to do that. Um, some will require a lot of changes, but I believe flexibility is going to be the key. We need to think about zoning controls and perhaps, you know, dolly um, installations so that we, when the space changes, lighting can change and adapt with it. Um, I think that's a challenge in general uh, to design a quote unquote flexible space in terms of lighting, but I think we need to give it our best go. It's funny you should say that because another question just popped up. It said, should we expect to see more DALI systems or other controls offering individualized lighting control of a pers person-specific work areas? So I think you kind of... I think so. Um, and it's not necessarily that it's personal control, um, but it's sort of... of responding to the changing needs of the space. So if the space is going to shift and the space is going to change and the physical boundaries of the space may change, I think it's really important to understand this. Also, it's so much easier to do it like, um, you know, in terms of construction, like uh, we had a project here that was, you know, starting construction. They were like, oh, can we go back and add zero to 10 volt uh, controls to everything? And I was like, wait, whoa, no. Like that's so much, so, so, so complicated. You need a separate conduit. You need, you know, it's a lot of things. So in terms of installation and upfront cost is higher. So we also need to work around that. But yes, like flexibility and controls, I think is key right now um, in terms of, of, you know, leaving these spaces prepped for quote unquote the future, which we all don't know what it looks like right now. Gotcha. Okay, this is going to be my final question for now. Uh, and it is, do you think that the pandemic is accelerating the push for wellness in construction? And if so, how? I hope so. <laughs> um, health is in everyone's uh, mind right now, which I think is fantastic. And I think people are starting to really, really notice the um, the influence that lighting can have on a person, on yourself. So I really hope that this is a push to, to understand that lighting just goes beyond the object. You know, lighting has an impact on the spaces and above all on us, we inhabit these spaces and anything and everything that I can use to argue quality, I will use it because we live under these lights for, you know, or we used to for eight, 10 hours a day, you know, what, what do these environments do to us? We don't necessarily understand all that. And we need to be well. One thing that I was discussing with somebody is like, we need to come out of this pandemic physically healthy and emotionally healthy. We all need to come out of this ready to hit the ground running and we need to be okay. And perhaps lighting needs to help us with that. Lighting needs to help us be okay. Yeah, and I'm sure it will. 
Well, Maria, I want to thank you for all the work that you did put into this presentation. You did a wonderful job. I'd also like to thank Douglas and Alexa and Nancy and the, the rest of the LIRC staff. I'd remind everyone to check your emails for your dues as they're coming due shortly. And we thank you very much and look forward to the next event, which is next month. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much for this opportunity and have a wonderful day. You too. Nancy, it's back to you, I guess, or? Yes, I just wanted to say thank you, John, and thank you, Maria. That was really a very spirited, well thought out, and well delivered presentation, and we really, really appreciate your time. Um, thank, you. So thank you. It was great, and I hope everyone in the audience enjoyed it as well. I do want to say you hit the nail on the head when you said over and over the need for collaboration, and that is one of the, the columns of why the LIRC exists, and that is for the collective collaboration with the ILD. And we are tasked, clearly this is one of many changes in lighting that are going to happen when, when life changes get back. So that, so again, it's one of our pillars with collaboration. So it's, it's really important and um, thank you. And thank you again, John, for reminding everyone of their dues because you know I was going to say that before. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> uh, oh, no, no, keep it coming. Um, and for any one of our manufacturer invited guests, please feel free to reach out to anyone have, if you have any questions about how to join. We certainly would welcome it. So thank you all. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, John. Thank you, your participants. Please take care.